after we test drove the W205 Mercedes C-Class a couple of weeks ago, today we take a step back and look at its predecessor, the W204. In fact, it's my own car, so I know it pretty well now. So join me as we explore Mercedes' previous generation C-Class. So this is an S204 Mercedes C-Class, a C250 in this case, from 2010. This is the first generation of the third generation of Mercedes' popular C-Class. Now regarding quality, throughout the late 90s, early noughties, Mercedes had been on something of a downy. Their reputation was definitely taking a hit and very much being tarnished by poor reliability, bad electricals, rust. We were seeing five-year-old Mercedes with rusty wings, which was not good for a premium band at all. So when the 204 came out, they had to throw everything at it. They had to go and get to next door's kitchen sink and throw that as well, because if they didn't make it right with this car, they were sunk. Their reputation was gonna be gone forever. So the W204, S204 as an estate, is potentially the best Mercedes of the last 50 years. So for that reason, it was the first car they'd ever done using a digital prototype. They digitally, virtually crash tested it and digitally, virtually drove it millions of miles before they even stamped a bit of metal out to see how the car actually fitted together in the real world. So by the time it was revealed at the 2007 Geneva Motor Show, they knew they had a solid product. And reliability surveys over the last, well, 10 years now, have proved them to be absolutely right. And this car generally doesn't go wrong. And the car was designed by Karl Heinz Bauer under design director Peter Pfeiffer at Mercedes Design Studio. They were the same pair who had been responsible for the W210 and the C207 previously, the, the roundy double bubble faced Mercedes of uh, previous generation. In this generation though they went for a very different style, lots of edges, lots of lines, lots of sharp creases which make the thing look very angular, very determined and it's actually kind of out of place of the design language of the time but kind of makes the thing look a bit timeless. So now 10 years on it doesn't look like a 10 year old car, it just looks like a car that exists in its own right and so so that means it's aged really well it's aged really gracefully if it, if it didn't have a date related plate on the front you wouldn't necessarily know it was a 10 year old car and even a pre-facelift car at that now unlike the, the w205 which has got more face options than you can possibly imagine there's only really two different options for the grill on this one this is the amg sport line which has also got the matching lower bumper side skirts and bigger wheels which make the car look a bit more aggressive and actually kind of fill the car out the other option on the sort of avant-garde classic designs was to have the flatter grill with the pop-up little star on top of the bonnet but those models can look a little bit bland without the extra amg sharper styling bits which kind of really complement the bodywork Moving around to the back of the car, the Estate or Touring version actually works really well. This is a really nice bit of design which I think actually works as well, if not better, than the Saloon version. All these sharp creases and edges and lines that, that come down the side of the body all kind of tidy up neatly into the da tailgate where they kind of wrap around into the glass, into the lights, all the lines into the boot line and the bumper just work perfectly. And a lot of them do come with these roof rails as well which do hold the design together really well. Now load space on the S204 is fairly decent, it's 485 litres, and that's 10 litres down on the S205 which replaced it, but significantly better than the 3 series equivalent, the E90, which is only 460 litres. However, that being said, it's actually a really useful space, it's much more usable than either of those cars, because although it's smaller than the later C-Class, it actually feels like a bigger space with, I don't know, maybe it's just the depth of it or something, but you can, feels like you can get more into this particular boot. Now, as well as being a nice wide space, which goes back a fairly long way, um, you've got lots of other additional storage in here. You've got big cubby holes on both sides. This one's labelled as the first aid kit, and there is indeed a first aid kit and various other bits and pieces, like a, an inverter and the fuse box in there. The left-hand one isn't quite such a big space because you've got a big recessed uh, area with an elastic pocket on the front um, that you can just access easily from inside the boot, but it does open, giving you a bit of a dumping ground for little used things. As I say, you've got a big elastic pocket on the left, you've got an elastic little thing on the right, which is handy for all kinds of stuff you use frequently. So I've got my uh, antibacterial cleaner, quick detailer, car wipes, spare batteries, padlock, because I padlock all my gear into the car, this kind of stuff. And underneath the floor, you've got even more storage. Now this car actually came with the uh, carpeted, rubberized load space mat to keep it all protected and safe forever and ever. You pull this out and you've got a really nice carpeted area. Now that in the bottom of this nice carpeted area you've got four lash down points so you can hold things down. In fact I've used it to put a solid chain down so no one can nick my gear as I mentioned. This board lifts up, lifts out if you want, giving you access to this kind of little polystyrene little, little tray of things so you can put odds and sods, bits and pieces, stuff you might need in a pinch, your warning triangle if you're going to France, your blowy things in case you get pulled over by the police other bits and bobs and below that finally I've got a spare wheel well which has got a 
space saver spare tire, jack your locking wheel nut, and lots more room. And I've got room in fact for a set of jump leads and other just bits and pieces. I don't think this is counted in that 485 litres. This is just additional extra storage down here, which you can just take advantage of. Now you've also got lights on both sides of the boot in the back. You've got a 12 volt socket here on the right hand side and on both sides you've got a little pop out hook so you can hang shopping bags safe. Now that's before you even get to the cleverness of the low space cover. Now like in the 5 series, this is a multifunctional thing. So as well as having the low space cover built into there, you've got a dog guard or luggage protector which hooks into the ceiling. And these things are very, very heavy indeed. If you've ever tried to lift one of these things out, you know it weighs a ton. And then, and then what do you do with it? It's a massive heavy bit of metal you're gonna put somewhere if you're making space in the back of the car for luggage, it's just in the way. Not so this one, observe. When the seats go down, and it's just a simple handle on the top, no, no clever trickery from remote distances, it's a 60-40 split. And the load space cover goes with the 60% part. The back seat bench doesn't fold forward, so it's not 100% flat, but it's nearly flat. And when it is flat, it becomes enormous. And with the seats down, there's 1,500 litres of space in here. I've carried furniture. The back screen from the Rover Tomcat came home in this. Complete sets of more than four wheels. It's not very tall, but it is a good space being regarded as a premium product, the carpet in the back of it is actually all very, very nice, very soft, very hard wearing as well. So it feels, even the boot of this car, feels like a nice place to be. Under the bonnet, there's a lot of choice from the tax and MPG friendly 1.6 petrol up to the utterly insane V8 of the C63 AMG. But a lot of these cars did come out with the M651 four cylinder twin turbo diesel. And most of these engines wind up in the C220, but look around and you'll find one of these, the C250. It's the same motor, but with a different tune, meaning it's got a little bit more power. It still gets the claimed 55 MPG, but gets a sub seven second nought to 60 and a claimed 149 miles an hour. Almost as good MPG, but certainly quicker than the 154 horsepower 1.6. Of course, nowhere near as good as a 6.2 litre AMG. Interior quality is somewhere Mercedes has always been strong, and it's no exception here in the 204. The seats in this sports version are still very comfortable. The uh, bolsters are big and squishy and do hold you, but both seats do have adjustable lumbar support in the back. In fact, the seats are one of the only weaknesses this car has, as the, uh, the fake leather tends to split on the driver's side bolster which is a shame. Now the interior is littered with what designers like to call surprise and delight features. For example, the fold-out screen on the radio and sat-nav. That's more delightful than the actual radio and sat-nav, but we'll come back to that shortly. Now we talk about the scent of cars quite often on this channel, and there is something unusual about this car. It does have its own peculiar scent. It's kind of a slightly sweet, almost nutty smell. And even if you've been in the car with a, a, a smelly dog or a cup of coffee or something, the next day when you come back into the car, it's got that same smell back again. It's something permeating from the fabrics of itself. It's quite a homely, welcoming smell, actually. It's quite, quite pleasant, really. Now, everything in this interior feels really good and tough and solid, rattle and squeak free, which is what you'd expect from it. And the materials, generally, apart from this seat, are very good indeed. You are quite high below the belt line, so if you want to put your elbow on the thing, you have to raise your arm quite high. Even the hard bit of plastic at the top is actually a slightly soft, rubberized thing, which kind of squishes. If you notice after a long drive, your elbow does dent into it, which then slowly pops out again for when you climb in next time. There's not a lot of color detail in the car, but you do have this brushed aluminium swoosh, which other finishes are available in different trim levels. But in the middle of that, we do have our lock and unlock buttons, solid metal door handle release. And then we have this nice big panel here, which has got all of our electrical controls in the door. Starting at the top, we've got the electric mirrors and our power fold as well which can be set to be automatically closing the mirrors when you lock the car and opening when you unlock the car, or set to manual if you prefer. Below that, we have all four electric windows with one touch on all four doors, and of course, a lockout for the kids in the back so they can't be driving you crazy. A big solid door handle with the slightly rubbery plastic on the front again, but with solid hard plastic on the back, so it's a nice firm grip for slamming the door, should you wish to be aggressively slamming your door. Below that, there's a nice big cubby hole, which is um, not massively wide, but it's a good enough side for wallets, uh, chocolate, bars um, if you're taking rubber gloves to the petrol station these days they'll fit in there quite happily and ahead of that is a large round speaker with a nice sort of chrome bezel making it look quite smart and fancy and you do have a tweeter up in the a-post as well another nice touch down here which is carried over to the s205 is this tailgate release so you can open and close the boot from the driver's seat now we have the driver's area of the dashboard. The steering wheel, this is a sport model, but it's not a massively sporting steering wheel. It's a nice solid leather thing, so it does feel quite good and tactile in your hands. It's 
multi-function of a sort. You've got um, controls for the onboard computer here on the left hand side and you have radio and phone controls on the right hand side because it's got Bluetooth links so you can hook your phone up make and receive phone calls through the steering wheel. While well, we're talking about the mobile phone we should mention this car is recent enough to accept the Mercedes Mi adapter update so you can plug the Mercedes Mi adapter into the uh, OBD port underneath the uh, dashboard and then you can have uh, real time um, and recorded information from the car regarding history, distances driven, location of the car as well. So that's quite useful information to be sent straight to your phone. The dials are really good looking, they're almost like little bits of jewellery here in the dashboard. The clear glass slopes towards you at the top, so the chrome bezels around each dial are actually elongated towards you at the top, but from the driver's seat you don't actually notice that so much, you just see the chrome bezel surrounding the dials themselves. And the dials are really attractive, the outermost circle is like a flat silver ring with a little black line sort of showing your increments, then you've got the black line inside that with the white or silver numbers on top of that, and the speedo in the centre, the central part, is actually an LCD screen giving you all kinds of information so you can have it set to speed readout, MPG, distance remaining, all kinds of different things within the trip computer. And so because you've got the central part not being a physical dial, the physical needle is actually attached on the outside edge of the dial. So that goes around as normal, but you have no center part of the needle, which is quite interesting. The two outer gauges on the left and right are traditional fully needled versions. The left-hand one is the fuel and the temperature gauge. Usefully the fuel gauge does have the arrow pointing to the right where the fuel filler is, which is good. And something which may alarm first time Mercedes drive is that the temperature cage doesn't sit at 80 in the center its normal position is to sit at 90 just above central which may confuse or worry some people the first time they drive one of these things on the right hand side you've got the rev counter which red lines not that high being a diesel it's just uh, but just over 4000 like 4001 or 200 rpm is where the red line begins and in between the two we've got the unique special mercedes everything on one stalk stalk indicators wipers rear wiper washers flashing the headlights all on this one thing if a cruise control that would be on a separate stalk underneath. Unusually this car doesn't come with cruise which is very unusual spec delete. The horn though is on the steering wheel. Let's give it a quick horn test. That's uh, nice, it's quite quite dignified, I like that. Good good road clearing ability. Now, the one thing that's not on this stalk is the actual headlight control. Uh, the dial for that on the right hand side, dip to the right, automatic in the center, then side lights and parking lights. There's not actually an off position on this, you only really have auto as closest to off, so it can decide to be on all the time if it chooses to. Of course that does have a headlight leveling adjuster as well, so if you've got heavy loads in the boot you can dip your headlights. And below that, the most annoying feature of any Mercedes, any car in fact, the park brake release because if you look down on the floor it's got four pedals this is a manual obviously so instead of having three pedals and a handbrake it's got the fourth pedal on the left which is your park brake which you have to push with your clutch foot which is partly why Mercedes tend to sell a lot more automatics than manuals uh, and to release that you do of course have your uh, fly off foot brake park release handle here under the dashboard why Mercedes why although I do prefer that to the electronic handbrake of the new one which I'm not a big fan of. Now, as I mentioned before, we've got the lovely surprise and delight feature of the pop-out screen for the infotainment system. Now, bypassing the hazard warning light and the, and the big um, air vents, this connects with the radio in the center section and the control wheel down here where the handbrake might be expected to be. If you're suffering with a glare from the sun, you can change the angle of the screen itself with that button there, or you can close it completely with that button. Of course, you can also reopen it with the button on the front of the cover. Here on the, the main controls for the infotainment, you've got a radio disc because it's got a CD player. It's actually got a DVD player in it. Bizarre spec choice. No cruise control, but it has got a DVD. You've got a sat nav, which is actually pretty woeful. You enter the destination using the dial down here behind the gear stick. It's only got a four digit postcode entry and it doesn't have all the roads you would expect or need to have in there. So it's really a bit of a disappointment as sat navs go. Returning home with that rib back button. Uh, you've got telephone functions so you can actually use the key, numeric keypad here to dial a number or you can use voice dialing through a button on the steering wheel which is probably easier and safer. Now we've got multi-stage heated seats in both front passenger seats obviously. Um, parking sensor turn off and on. There are three blanking plates in this car so I guess there are many other functions that you could have in this car which I haven't. Um, and moving down into the very very good uh, heating and ventilation control. It's dual zone auto climate. I personally am very keen indeed on these little knurled plastic rings which don't feel that solid but they do look really really good which give the temperature control for the individual sides of the car and the center of them are the auto function on the left and the air recirculate on the right. Then we've got our next surprise and delight feature here, a hidden little cubby hole. 
This is a non-smoker back car. They have to choose to have an ashtray in the car. So in the bottom of this little cubby hole, there's a little rubber thing with no smoking written on it. But you do have a nice 12 volt socket here. And then if you just push that, that slides back into place and covers the whole thing, giving you a nice flat bit of brushed aluminium. Other designs were available. Now here's the best bit of this car, the proper manual gearbox. Obviously Mercedes sell very few manuals and they get criticized heavily for the, the quality of the manual. It's a little more notchy than the BMW one, but it's actually not as bad as people make out. Now, I will say at this point, no T-shelf, T-shelf denied. No, you cannot balance anything on there. That's just foolhardy. Try and put anything on top of the um, pop-out screen. You're a fool. We do have a little roll desk top here in the center, which underneath that are two very good sized cup holders with spring-loaded uh, steadying gubbins in there. So you can actually put two good sized cups in there quite happily. So it's a good solid seven out of 10 because although there's no air for your sandwiches to fit, you can put two big cups here quite happily. Now the next of our surprise and delight things, on either side of this console, there's a black button hidden in the plastic Stick. open that and woof a very very big indeed cubby hole opens up here it's carpeted in the bottom so things don't rattle and it's very big indeed you can put yeah certainly a couple of pork pies sandwiches a uh, small bit of quiche maybe a bit of cake all fit in there and the glove box on the passenger side is lockable with the key which can be extracted from the back of the key fob open it up you've got a twin deck thing going on you've got pen holder coin holder business card um, slots all molded into this lid as well as this flat rubberized area so you can put a small amount of picnic in there if you should desire the top half is kind of carpety velour flock coated it's also air conditioned cooled so with a little dial in the top you can choose whether to have it cooled or not which is great for to put a chocolate bar in there for later and you've got a 12 volt socket in there as well i've actually got that plugged in powering my phone charger down here which is actually the best place i could find for it the seats are very comfortable they're a curious mix of manual and electric adjustment forward and backward is a manual switch there is um a pitch movement which is done manually with a wheel on the on the side down here on the uh, on the front edge but reclining and raising the seat squab up and down is done electrically so i don't know then you of course you have this little manual lumbar support adjustment on the side and the seat belts are height adjustable as well up in the ceiling both front seat passengers get a sun visor with a mirror and a light whoops get it in the right position to turn it on and they both have a little clips so you can put cards, CDs, and the center console ahead of the mirror, which is auto dimming, you've got two large passenger lights and a whole bunch of controls relating to the alarm system. So you can have volumetric turned off and on, uh, vibration turned off and on. And you choose to have the reading lights left and right turned off and on, the main lights turned off and on, and you can turn the rear passenger light off and on with that panel there. Now let's take a look in the back. Now, rear seat access actually isn't too bad. I think it's better than the, uh, the later car that replaced it. And knee room and leg room are quite acceptable as well. Certainly it's not an E-Class or a 5 Series, but then it's a smaller car all round. So you kind of get what you pay for in that respect, but it's quite respectable. It's three seats across the back with three full seat belts as well. So you've got the proper three point harness even in the center of the car. Well, it's not the most comfortable of seats as it is the vinyl ridge and you've got the um, transmission tunnel to contend with. In the door, you've got the same large mid range speaker as the front, a tweeter as well, same nice metal door handle, same brushed aluminum below the chrome trim line, all looking very smart indeed although it's just a large swathe of kind of black vinyl-y stuff here in the center, which isn't that pretty. Good solid door handle, got the same sort of semi-soft rubbery stuff for your elbow rest. That's quite a comfortable place to sit there. And of course, you've got the one-touch window and a nice little cubby hole. Back of both seats has got a reasonable sized uh, map pocket, although it is possible to break the, um, the top edge, as my wife found out for me a little while ago. Um, the seats aren't bad, they're fairly flat, but they're soft enough to be you know, quite comfortable and you have adjustable headrests in all three positions. In the center though, you do have this really nice pull-out armrest, which is very big, very wide, padded on top, so if you're using it as an armrest, it's nice and comfortable. But if you want, it can do way more than that. Open the top up, you've got a nice carpeted area here for putting small items, and the push little button here, and you get a couple of cup holders pop out. So you've got four cup holders throughout the car and a nice sandwich area here. Ideal for a cup of tea there, scorn there. So the rear T-shelf is actually far superior to the front T-shelf. Up in the ceiling, as well as the main courtesy light, which comes on with the doors, you do have individual courtesy lights left and right. 
and the main light can be turned on from the front seat, as I said a second ago. On both sides, there's a, a grab handle and a coat hook and pull up load guard dog net thing. Not only clips in behind the headrests, also there's a second clip up here um, behind the front headrest. So if you've got the seats rolled down, you can pull it all the way up and stop things intruding into the front passengers if you're using it as a, a two seater with a lot of the gear in the back. Headroom wise, it's not bad. The car does slope down quite heavily into the back, but there's enough space behind the back seats for that to continue tapering behind your head. So I'm actually sitting here not really feeling too badly contained or restrained. As the body line does continue to rise up throughout the length of the car, the um, belt line of the car is even higher in the back than it is in the front. So smaller children might feel a bit like they're struggling to peer out and see anything. So this generation C-Class was available as the Coupe, Saloon and Estate, known obviously as the C204, W204 and S204. But I think for ease of use, I'll probably keep on calling it W204 because people just tend to. This generation ran from 2007 to 2014 when it was replaced by the W205. And in 2008, it gained blue efficiency, which this car has. So the blue efficiency version got really quite incredible differences, like a higher efficiency bearings, the flat underbelly of the car for a lower air drag, and lighter windscreen even. Different wheels, different uh, flaps behind the grille to make the car more fuel efficient, more aerodynamic, and get better MPG, and so therefore better CO2 ratings. Cars were facelifted in 2011, meaning this is a phase one car, but they've got a different front end, different grille, different interior. The lights changed, so the wings and bonnet changed as well. There's quite a few significant differences between the Series 1 and Series 2. The interior quality was improved as well. Better materials and a nicer steering wheel. Being a car from 2010, this is a car from before the smartphone revolutions. There's not really anywhere to put a big phone, which is why I've put this phone holder on the side. And also, also phone integration is good, but not great. So you do struggle a bit connecting music devices to this car. There should be an auxiliary input in the glove box, but this car is missing it for some reason. I said earlier the big overriding drive with this car was for quality they were looking to make this thing as reliable and as trustworthy and dependable as they could in order to bring back the quality that had fallen away from their reputation and bring it all back home and to that end they drove 24 million kilometers in test versions and prototypes of these cars in every condition and it's something that manufacturers do anyway drive a lot of miles in a lot of conditions in extreme heat extreme cold over rough surfaces but they took it to the nth degree with this and so now they've built a car which just really doesn't go wrong talking to a tow truck driver when i was researching this i asked if he ever came out to these and he said do you know what I haven't seen one in ages. So that's kind of a good recommendation. If the breakdown services don't think they see them very often, you're probably onto a winner. Some of the early ones had issues with oil leaks and that kind of thing, but that was all tidied up very quickly indeed. And the bodywork doesn't rust, the paintwork doesn't dull or mark. This car, for example, is a 2010 car, so it's now 10 years old with over 100,000 miles on it. And still, it looks fresh. It looks like it left the factory just a couple of weeks ago. Now the other thing they were pushing for was to make it more of a driver's car because Mercedes always led the way in comfort and BMW led the way in driver satisfaction but they wanted a bit more of that for themselves as well so they've still got the comfort aspect. The car is still extremely nice to be in. You know, the steering wheel is in a nice place, it's adjustable obviously. Uh, the seats are supportive and comfy. You've got a great view out of the thing and everything you touch just feels really nice and high quality. Um, there's no kind of creaky cheap plastic feel anywhere. It's it either feels like real metal or it feels like solid plastic or some kind of rubberized surface. Everything in it is good in that respect. But they've also done a little bit more to tighten up the chassis, make it a bit more responsive. Still, it's not quite as light and rewarding as a 3 Series would be, but it's a tiny percentage off. And especially with the manual gearbox. It's more notchy and a little bit stiffer than a 3 Series box, but at the same time, it's certainly more rewarding than the automatic would be. Another thing which came with the uh, facelift in 2011 was a seven speed automatic, which is very highly regarded in terms of its smooth shifting, its quickness and responsiveness. So if you do decide to go that way, then you won't be disappointed. 
Now that handbrake or park brake is actually quite annoying, it has to be said. Um, you do get hill hold assist, so if you put your foot on the foot brake and then release it, you do get a few seconds of grace as the car just holds it there for you for a moment. But if there's a delay at the junction, you can find yourself rolling very gently backwards into traffic, so you do need to be very aware of that. Now the performance for one of these things is actually surprisingly good, especially in the AMG Sport line like these are with the 250 engine. They can really surprise people off the line. They're far more sporting and accelerative than you might expect just by looking at, especially the cooking models. So 0 to 60 on the C250 is under, under seven seconds. So we're 40 miles an hour already. That actually showed that Golf R a clean pair of heels off the line, which is quite surprising. Now, a lot of these cars, especially the four cylinder diesels, were bought as company cars because they were good on tax, good on fuel, and a good residual, so you got good um, company car deals on them. So, a lot of them will have spent a lot of time on the motorway, so it will have big miles, but at the same time, it won't have been very hard wearing miles. And also, if they've been company cars, they will have been serviced regularly, which is a good thing to watch out for. Now, a thing worth mentioning regarding service on these cars is they use the Mercedes Star Service System. So, if anyone does service the car, if they want to record it on the car's history, they have to have access to the Mercedes computer, which limits the number of people who can service it and record the fact it has been serviced. So, if you're looking to buy one secondhand, then do check the service history it is up to date with Mercedes. And if it's not, then you might want to haggle a discount. Now the steering is nicely weighted. Obviously it's electrically power assisted being a car of this era, but that doesn't mean it's completely free of feel. It's actually quite a nice system, which loads up well into corners and gives you a good bit of feedback. Now I absolutely love the styling of this car. I actually much prefer it to the current generation. I think the sharp edges, the creases and everything just look so more purposeful and aggressive and far more timeless as well. Um, I think that the whole design is more cohesive and I apparently am not alone because in 2007 this was a car of the year multiple times in different publications and ultimately they went on to sell 2.4 million of these vehicles around the world. Of course they built them around the world as well but generally estate ones came from single Felden or from Bremen and having checked on uh, a VIN decoder this particular car was built in Bremen. Now, as an AMG Sportline car, which is basically the equivalent to an M Sportline, not a full fat M Sport, a full fat AMG, but it's got lots of the bits. So it's got the AMG suspension, which is slightly lower. It's got the AMG drill brakes, which give it a really good stopping bite. It does drive really well. The brakes are nice and sharp. The ride is a great compromise between tight handling and a comfortable ride. On a long journey, you'll get out feeling refreshed, but if you find a twisty back road and you want to have some fun, just drop a gear and push the car a little, it will still do it for you quite happily. And I know a Mercedes with a manual gearbox is an unusual choice, but I think this car is way more rewarding for having that, despite the compromise of the awkward parking brake. Now I have to admit, I actually quite like the sound of this kind of slightly growly diesel. Now I'm aware that it is used in some commercial Mercedes vehicles as well, like vans and things. But with the different exhaust manifolds and so forth, in this particular application, it's got a nice refined grunt. It's not too intrusive, but when you put your foot down, it does also give you quite a nice, I don't know, an aggressive little grrr. But when you're just easing off, letting the car poodle, it's quiet, refined. It really doesn't give any kind of intrusion into the cabin, there's no vibration to worry about. I have to say, as a 204 owner, I've been really impressed with basically everything about this car. It's proven itself to be efficient in terms of fuel economy, it's cheap to tax, it's cheap to insure. Um, I've not had to repair it, thankfully, so I don't really know about that. Servicing at a Mercedes independent non-franchise specialist, so I can get the book stamped, um, has not been massively expensive either. And in terms of visits to that service centre, I've only really been in there for regular routine maintenance. The only non-maintenance thing I've had to do is a bush on the gearbox, which is starting to wear, but at over 100,000 miles and 10 years, it's not surprising a rubber bush is starting to give. So 
are nitpicking and looking for faults with this car, you have to struggle a little bit, to be honest. You can't turn the lights all the way off. The auto setting is the only one. This little seat bolster does wear out quite a lot. And you look at the second-hand ones and they're pretty much all the same. The radio reception isn't the absolute best and the sat-nav is terrible. That's kind of it, really. Reading a few contemporary reviews from when the car came out 10 years ago, you do come across things like people complaining that rear legroom isn't that great, but I'm 5'11 and I sit in the back and I don't have a problem. People complain the drive isn't as good as a BMW, but there did seem to be a lot of heavy 3 Series bias in the motoring press about 10 years ago. And I'm not saying it's misplaced because that was a really good car, but it wasn't as much better than this car as they were saying at the time. And there is something, I mentioned this in the end of the 205 video, there is something a little bit special feeling about this car. There shouldn't be because it's just a big pile of metal and rubber and glass. But you climb into this thing and maybe it's just the way that the paint has got that little sheen to it, that metal Mercedes plate as you step over the door, just the way everything feels as you touch it. It feels a little bit special. You don't get that in other models quite so much. But that's where the premiumness lies. That little indescribable something that just says this car is in some way special. Well, thank you for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about the last generation C-Class Mercedes, the W or S204. Personally, and this has probably come out in the review, I'm a huge fan of this model. This really was a make or break model for the company. And just driving the car, it's clear it was a make situation. Looking at the number of Mercedes now on the road, this clearly was a turning point for the company and it turned in the right direction. Thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please hit like, please hit subscribe. If you like the channel, come buy a sticker. It'll look great on your car and it'll help support the channel too. Join me again next time when I'm driving, well, who knows what. Goodbye.